Isn't there just a special presence in the house? I feel like we should just hug again and like just... <laughs> oh man, I'm enjoying it. Last week it was just such a special activation in worship. If you weren't here, I want to encourage you to go online and, and just experience with us what took place. And um, God is just releasing... He's doing something in, the, in, in this church, and I believe he's doing it in the church in general, where worship becomes the main thing again. And not just singing, but a transformation of hearts, where people actually realize they can't, we can't do anything without worship and without being in his presence. And so God is breaking that, that, that I want to say, the habit of you know, church on Sunday and then world in the week and activities. And I want to say it's going to become impossible. Say it with me, impossible. <laughs> to function without worship. And that means we get into worship, we get into that space wherever we can. There's nothing more important than worship. Remind you, Solomon said the beginning of all wisdom is the worshipful fear of God. And so that's really where all wisdom starts. If, you, if you're looking for wisdom, you're going to get it, but you're going to find it in worship. Is that good? Okay. So Friday uh, afternoon, how many of you enjoyed that storm that just brewed on Friday? Was anyone in Pretoria in this area? It was just, I, I must say the last two evenings have been the most beautiful evenings. It's that classic hot day and then storm brewing and what makes it even more special is the sun sets underneath the clouds. So in the west, there's no rain, right? So, so the sun sets there, and, and then the sun comes in underneath, and it's just absolutely beautiful. So we ready, you know, we were, we were getting ready to braai on Friday night, me and, and, and the kids. And, and how many of you know storm plus braai, not, not awesome, you know, and so fire's going, and the storm comes in, and I'm like, Michael, let's go up the treehouse. Why? Because the tree's going like this. Okay, and I'm like, let's go. We're going to go up to the top of the tree. And um, lightning's far away, disclaimer. You know, we don't do stuff like that. I didn't want my faith electrified uh, in that moment. And so we're up the tree, and we have to hold on. It's like, you know, and the fire's like, and, and we're just like, yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> and Michael looks at me and he goes, Dad, this feels like nothing is impossible. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, that song, Nothing is Impossible, it's like there's a storm coming and you've made a fire and you have a cup of coffee and you climbed up the treehouse and it's like... <laughs> and I'm like, Michael, if only you knew what you were saying. And if only you knew how, listen, you must have deep kids, guys, because <laughs> Michael just tapped into something in the spirit and, and tapped into something of what faith really is. And I stood there and I was like, Michael, if only you knew. If only you knew the storms that are actually brewing around. If only you could actually see the faith journey that mom and dad are on and and the, the way that we have to press into faith when sometimes things don't look great. How many of you know in, in this, I, I was just realizing that storms in that moment visually just represented anything that comes to take your peace. And yeah, we are trying to make a little bry and Michael is stirred and he's like, this is like nothing is impossible. And I want to tell you, nothing is impossible. <laughs> to me, fire represents two or three things, and, and I just felt God say, we, there is a radical faith that believes nothing is impossible. Say with me, radical. Okay, how many of you are radical? Just put up your hand if you believe you are radical. Okay, these are the crazy ones. Just look at them for a moment. All right. <laughs> But the Bible, <laughs> not the Bible, no. no. I, there is a radical faith. There is a way that certain people stood out because of their radical faith. 
and their ability to believe that they were going to bry, even though the storm was coming. Okay? <laughs> so turn to the person next to you. Say, I am radical because I have faith. All right, faith is supposed to make you radical. You can't have faith and not be radical. You can't have faith and not be different. You can't have faith and not press through and break through. Hello? Faith is not comforting. Can I say that again? Faith is not comforting. Faith transforms you and gives you strength so that you can press on even though there's a storm. Sometimes there's more than one storm. Sometimes it's all around. Sometimes there is no blue sky. Some of us think faith is blue sky. Oh, it opened up. It feels good again. No, faith is when it's dark, when it's cloudy, I I'm going to press on to the race that God has called me to. Someone say amen. amen. So the fire represents the brine, represents three things in this story. Firstly, it represents process. On this Friday, I was brying with wood from a tree that had fallen down in our yard. So the brine becomes a process because that's how I get rid of a problem. How many of you have had a tree fall down in your yard before? Anyone? Did you see how many trees fell over people's walls this week? All right? So it becomes a problem. But if you deal with that problem in a methodical and a process way, you can turn a problem into a, say, bri. <laughs> okay? You can take a problem and you can cut it up into small pieces. Amen, says Jono. When I met Jono at his house the first time, he's, the first thing Jono said is, I like to bra. <laughs> I'm like, that's it. That's, that sums him up completely. Okay. So, you can take any problem and you can turn it into a? A bra. All right. Can I say that again? You can take any problem and you can turn it into a? <laughs> Are we a quiet church or what? <laughs> So how do you deal with a problem? You cut it into small pieces. And you deal with a problem bit by bit until you can actually use what you've been given. That's why James said, it is a joy when we face trials and tribulations because they teach us to have braai. <laughs> Patience. And the development of character and then maturity, which equals, there we go. Now we're on a roll. Okay. <laughs> okay, so to me, the fire represents process. Second, the fire represents the fact that we release stored energy. Hello? You release stored energy. So it doesn't help you've built up patience and character and you have maturity and you don't actually get to use it. Hello? Now you're like, what are you talking about? Okay, a tree stands on the ground. Where does it get its substance from? Anyone do biology? The sun, the ground... Water. Okay, how many of you know that a tree photosynthesizes carbon? It takes carbon dioxide out of the air. It keeps the carbon and it gives us fresh air, oxygen. Okay, what does that carbon become? Wood, which becomes bright, but it becomes wood. Okay. So have you ever realized that when you look at a tree, everything you see physically there has come out of the air? Have you ever thought about that? It sucks water up from the ground, uses the nutrients for the process, but what you see is carbon 
pulled out of the air that when it dries becomes stored energy. And you take that carbon, you light it with a match and you say, be free. And the flame transfers the carbon, where? Back into the air. Now everyone's like, greenhouse gas and whatnot. No, the trees are going to use it. Give us oxygen, the feeding trees. <laughs> okay, so within us, we have to have substance. Maturity is substance. It is us receiving from the Holy Spirit and we grow in maturity until we become substance. And the only way to withstand a storm is to have substance. Have you ever seen a palm tree on a beach in a hurricane? Substance plus flexibility. That's maturity. Substance and flexibility is maturity. Anyone with me? Okay, awesome. The third thing about a fire, it is surrender. Bernadine ministered on surrender this morning. <laughs> when you put that wood in, it surrenders. And what you get is a nice rump steak. Thanks to the wood surrender. Okay. Now, part of that surrendering is to surrender to the process and to surrender to the process that God puts us on and gives us. And so when we are facing a storm, oftentimes you'll come to a river, right? And how you approach that river is what is most important if you have faith and if you have spiritual maturity. You see, a lot of people approach the river uh, from a from a position of want and need and not from a position of spiritual prosperity. And I love this about Stephen De Silva's book, Money and the Prosperous Soul. He says, when we're in the presence and we approach the presence with a spirit of prosperity, we walk out into the middle of the river, we turn and face the throne room, we put out our hands and we wait to receive that which God gives us. And so what comes along is what God gives us and we take hold of it. But if you're not in prosperity, you're standing on the side of the river watching things go by. And you're waiting for the one thing that looks nice. And when you jump in, you've already missed it. And so you end up chasing things sideways, this way and that way and this way and that way. And there's no surrender to the process of God, which is to face the throne room and receive in His presence. That is what it means to surrender. That is the process that God has got us on. God has got us on a process of first being established in worship, being established in the river, looking at God's kingdom and waiting for Him to send exactly what you need. Someone say amen. Okay. Now Proverbs 31 uh, I don't think, it's, sorry, let me just turn to Proverbs 31 here. Uh, I spoke about it last week. Right, let's, it's Proverbs 30, verse 15. Now, there's a kind of person who believes they never will receive the fullness they have from God. They never believe that God is good. They don't believe that God will enrich them with everything they need. And actually, the Bible talks about them in Proverbs 30. It says, the leech. Now, what is a leech? Okay, a leech is something that sucks. Okay, it sucks. That's the Hebrew translation. It sucks. Okay, and it has two daughters. And the one daughter says give and the other daughter says give. And there are three things that are never satisfied. Yes, four that do not say it is enough. One is the place of the dead. Two is a barren womb. Three is the earth that is not satisfied. And four is a fire that says it, that says not it is enough. Have you ever seen a fire burn and say it is enough? No, a fire is always hungry. Hungry. 
because if it doesn't have more wood, it's going to die. And so I, realized, I just felt that God wants to highlight that in us, in our lives. We can't always be saying, it is not enough. Hello? Did, did I, that makes sense? Someone who constantly moans that it's not enough sucks. <laughs> it sucks. And we actually say that. It sucks. This sucks. See, that's coming from not being in the stream, not being in the place of worship. If you're in a place of worship, you always have enough. Hello? You always have enough. Why? Because your spirit is in a place of rest, is in a place of worship. So you add to, nothing is impossible. You add the phrase, there is always enough. And he's not necessarily speaking about your finances. He's not necessarily speaking about your relationships. The fullness of God is only established in your spirit. And in your spirit, you have the ability to do all things, to conquer all things, to go through all things. Paul wrote and says, I know what it is to have much, and I know what it is to have little. But despite that, despite that, so there is always enough. And so the problem with not being in the river is, is that you get externally focused. You're always waiting for things to fill you up, for things to make you happy. But you're not realizing that it's the presence of God that fills you. And nothing can fill you more than the presence of God. Someone say amen to that. All right, we sang about praise is a highway to the heart of God. Why? Because it opens up our door to gratefulness. It doesn't matter what kind of storm is coming. Be grateful. Go into God's presence. We taught, we've been teaching our people, we've been teaching us how to pray. First thing we pray for is peace. All right. That praise opens up a highway to experience the full peace of God. So if you're not experiencing peace, where, where do you go? Praise. Gratefulness. That's what opens up the door. All right, I haven't even started. This is just the intro to the, to the message. Turn to the person next to you and say, this was just the intro. You've got to sound excited. <laughs> These were just the establishing facts. No. All right. Here's what I felt God really wanted to say, and, and I needed to prepare the ground a bit before we got there. 1 Corinthians 10, Paul's writing. And he says, do not be ignorant. That's a great, great line, one-liner there. Do not be ignorant. Turn to the person next to you. Say, I am not ignorant. Okay, now you've made a prophetic declaration there. You've just said something. We're going to hold you to that. I am not ignorant. Okay, and then he goes and he, he says that our forefathers were all under, do not be ignorant, that our forefathers were all under and protected by the cloud. And everyone in which God's presence went before them. And every one of them, I want you to listen carefully to these words, and every one of them passed safely through the sea. And each one of them allowed himself to be baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all of them ate the same spiritual food, and they all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from a spiritual rock, which followed them, and the rock was Jesus Christ. So even the Israelites drank from the same spiritual food. They had the same word that we have today. 
they had a prophetic picture of who Jesus was. But they were ignorant to it, and they did not see it, because their eyes were on the storms. Their eyes was on the sea. Was That's not good English. Eyes were, their focus was on the sea. And their longing was to go back to the land of slavery from which they had came from. And when we focus our eyes back to where we've come from, we take our eyes off of the throne and out of God's presence. So God is saying, we're moving. Now, one of the values we're establishing in this church is the fact that we are already in the promised land. Okay, say that with me. I am in the promised land. What that means is, is, not the, is that you are not now not in the promised land and then trying to go from point A to point B and then one day there's going to be this moment where you're like, ah, oh, now I'm in it. No, you are already in it. So, so Joseph and Caleb went into the promised land and they went in with faith. And what they saw is that the promised land was already theirs. But because they had a democratic vote, and 10 voted no, and 2 voted yes, how many of you know the promise is not established in democratic votes? It's established in faith. That was going to be my line. Thanks, Justin. All right. So, even though Joshua and Caleb were in the desert with the rest of them, where were their hearts? Someone say it. In the promised land. Hello? So, you are in the same way. You have the same spiritual food. You have the same revelation of Jesus Christ. And you have the same faith. And Paul's writing and he's saying, don't be ignorant of that. In other words, look at their story. Look at what happened to them. Hello? Hello? So I'm, I'm looking at, Joseph, at Joshua and Caleb. I'm not looking at the other 10 guys. Does that make sense? That's the story I'm looking at. Because even though it might not feel like I'm in the promised land, my heart is. And what happens physically around us does not equal promised land or not. It's what happens inside here. It's the belief that I'm not a grasshopper but that the enemy themselves already feel like grasshoppers. I need to see it. I need to recognize it so that I can stand in the promise that God has given us. So, like Abraham who walked around in the promised land, we are currently walking around in the promised land. And God gives us the faith to experience the promised land. Because if there's one problem our world has is that they don't recognize that they are already in the promised land. They don't see it, they don't feel it, they don't hear it, they don't experience it. And that's what faith does. Faith helps you to experience the very promise that God has for you. You can be walking on that promise and not recognize it because your faith hasn't been activated. So activate the faith. Nothing is impossible. There is always enough. You are already in your promised land. Is that good? So Paul says in verse 15 of 1 Corinthians 10, he says, I'm speaking as to intelligent men. Say, I am intelligent. <laughs> now Paul says this, I am speaking as to intelligent, because not everyone he was speaking to was intelligent. They weren't seeing it. He was speaking to a group of people who were hearing it, but they weren't seeing it. So he said, I am speaking as if you are intelligent. And here's the most important thing. He says, think over and make up your minds for yourselves what I say. I appeal to your reasoning and to your discernment in these matters. And we can't do things we can't change our behavior. We can't, as a church, we can't do things because the pastor says so. 
We've got to do things because faith has been activated in our own hearts. That's what makes us wise. That's what makes us intelligent is the ability to hear the word, see its power and effect, and then make our own. Come on. Someone say yes. Are you quiet because you're listening or? (laughs) It's sinking in. God's calling the church to be spiritually sharp. Hello? Not dull. He's calling the church to wake up in its senses. So that your faith is not pressed by your emotions and the things that are going on, but you have a spiritual sharpness. Laser-eyed vision. Not distracted looking to the left or to the right, but sharp in the spirit. It's got to be like this. Jesus said, to, he said, you've got to be as peaceful as doves, but as cunning as a snake. He was referring to spiritual sharpness, to the ability to discern and act on the word, on the promise. Because maybe if the Holy Spirit says move and you think I'm going to wait about it, I'm going to go speak to 10 people, I'm going to get a couple of opinions, you might lose the promise. You might lose what God has given you. It doesn't matter what prophetic word is given you. It doesn't matter what is spoken out. If it hasn't already been spoken by the Holy Spirit into your spirit, you're not going to feel it. You need to be spiritually sharp. And so here's an example in 2 Kings 7. I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to tell you about it. Elisha walks into the city and he says, Tomorrow, this time, flour is going to cost one shekel. And two measures of barley is going to cost one shekel. And the king's right-hand man says, impossible. And Elisha in an instant says, you will see it, but you will not partake. That was a 30-second conversation. Sharpness in the spirit. The king's right-hand man was not standing in the river. He was not seeing with his spiritual eyes. He was not seeing that nothing is impossible, that there is always enough, that we are already in the promised land. He was not positioned in spiritual sharpness. So he said, ah, I don't believe it. The very next day, someone say the next day, at that exact time, the people stampeded out to go and fetch the army, the Syrians' loot, the spoil that had been left. And the very next day, flour cost one shekel. The king's right-hand man was trampled dead in the gates. He ate the same spiritual food. He had the same revelation of Jesus. Hello? Because God is the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. So the same principles apply. Be sharp in the spirit so that you can say yes to the promises of God. Amen? It's so important that we're willing to say yes to the unction of the Holy Spirit quickly. I'm not going to tell that story again. I've told it so many times, but that's how we bought our house. Ran past the house. God said, if you don't stop, you're going to miss it. The next day, there were three offers on the house, and ours was first at 8 a.m. Bought the house. I realized we have to be sharp 
in the Spirit. If the Holy Spirit gives you an unction, act on it. Because it means you're positioned in God's presence. Don't let things wait. Don't give up. Press in. Someone say amen. amen. Ephesians 4 verse 17. Okay, I'm going to skip that one. I feel like let's go straight to Hebrews 12. It says, let us therefore, receiving a kingdom, it's Hebrews 12, verse 28 to 29. Let us therefore, receiving a kingdom that is firm and stable and cannot be shaken, offer to God pleasing service and acceptable worship with modesty and care, with godly fear and awe. For God is indeed a consuming fire. He's quoting the very words of Moses in Deuteronomy 4, verse 23. Moses is telling the Israelites as they move over into the promised land with Joshua as their leader. He tells them, take heed for yourselves lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God which he made with you and you make for yourselves a graven image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. He is a jealous God. These are the words of a man who struck the rock when he was told to speak to the rock. These are the words of a man who is releasing the kingdom into new leadership, who understands that he will see it but not partake. This is the last words of Moses to the Israelites. Because in Deuteronomy 4, just before that, he tells them, you will cross over, but I will stay and I will die. Because God is indeed a consuming fire. A jealous God. God desires all of our worship. And if we don't press into his worship, if we don't give him everything, that's, that's what's happening in this church. That's what's happening. I just There is such a strong sense that now is not the time for delaying. Now is not the time for pretending to have faith. Now is not the time for half offering. Now is the time to give everything. Now is the time for a full living sacrifice of the body of Christ. And it's bigger than this church. It's our communities. It's our country. It's our nation. If we don't surrender and give God all, we will never see the kingdom of God established. Or maybe we'll see it, but we won't partake of it. This is God, the consuming fire, the jealous God speaking. The writer of Hebrews pulled that very word from Deuteronomy into the New Testament, if that's what you're thinking. God is indeed a consuming fire. And He is jealous for our worship. And He desires of us to press in with sincere worship. But not just to worship, but to actually press in to what God has for us. To see that we are in the promised land. So that we can represent the kingdom. And we can represent his presence. Is that good? Yes. Ephesians 4, 23. Let's go there. Can you pass me? I'm struggling now. To, there we go. Got it, got it, got it. 
And be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. And put on the new nature created in God's image, in true righteousness and in holiness. Holiness is that position where we have put on the new nature of Jesus Christ. And we no longer represent, look like, smell like, taste like anything in the world. But we look like the full nature of Jesus Christ at work in us. I thought that's where everyone's going to jump up on their chairs and cheer. And but there is a moment where we put on the full nature, the new nature. And that's what God wants to do. And I want to encourage every person. To say, Jesus, I want to put on the new nature of your holiness. Holiness isn't something special that's reserved for the few. Holiness is something that God wants to give to every single person. The problem with our societies, with our cultures, is that we revere specific people as holy where actually God is giving every single person sitting here the ability to put on the full nature of Jesus Christ and His holiness. Because God's calling us into a maturity as the body, not as specific people. But for that to take place, the body has to wake up and realize, wow, we can have the nature the full nature of Jesus. He's, his Bible is so, the word is so full of promise that speaks about the fact that all of us get to put on the nature of Jesus, that the very power that raised Jesus from the cross is inside of us. Even in Genesis, God looked at what he had created and he said, it is good. Husbands turn to your wife and say, I'm good. I'm good because God said so. God wants to heal us, to heal us out of the belief that we're not good, that we're not worth it, that we're not walking in God's promise, that we're not walking in how He created us to be. It's that waking up, realizing that when I walk with faith, when I walk with promise, I walk in a nature that God from the beginning has said is good. And so we get to be established as powerful people in our communities. Regardless of the storm, nothing is impossible. There is always enough. And I am in the promised land. Is that good? So what did I do during the storm? What did I do? My fire was in the rain. Put a real damper on everything that was happening. Took a cup of coffee. Watched the rain fall. How many of you know it takes a lot of rain to kill a fire? Hello? I need some Stephen Furtick organs behind me right now. <laughs> it takes a lot of rain to kill a fire. <laughs> so where was I? I was at the wood stack. I had my axe out. I was getting ready to relight the fire. Because I knew when that rain goes, there are going to be coals that are still hot. My faith is still alive. And as soon as the last drop fell from the sky, I put my wood on that fire. I gave it one blow and boof, we're back in business, baby. 
Don't give up in the storm. But get ready. Use the time to prepare the next fire. Use the time to be energized. Use the time to get ready. Because God is a consuming fire. But He wants to light a fire of passion in every person in this room. And if you're not ready, if you give up, you ain't going to (laughs) burn. Hello? Are you going to do a song? That was a hint. I need a Stephen Furtick organ in the background. (laughs) Can we have the worship team up? And we're just going to close. Yeah. Let's stand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just put out your hands to receive. Thank you, Father. Holy Spirit. We thank you for your comfort in the room this morning. And God, we all come from different backgrounds. We all come from different experiences. And some of our storms are darker than others. Some of our storms have come and have been blowing for a long time. But God, we thank you that even in the storm, you are there. And even in the storm, you walk into the boat, you call us out into your presence, and you say, fix your eyes on me. There is peace in the storm. There is promise in the storm. There is provision in the storm. There is protection in the storm. Father, we thank you that this morning we can, even in the midst of a storm, fix our eyes on you. We thank you, Lord, that your presence is poured out in our hearts. Your presence is poured out in our spirits. And we respond to your call this morning. God, fill our hearts with courage. Fill our hearts with faith. Fill our hearts with grace. We're so thankful that life is found in you. So God, I want to exercise that faith. I want to be energized by your courage that you give. I want to be energized by your presence. And I thank you for the fact that your hand is on me. And your hand rests on me this morning. And I'm filled with a joy that doesn't make sense. With a peace that isn't dependent on circumstance. I am filled with a hope that I can't explain. God, I'm filled with you. And I'm filled with your presence. So we thank you for that presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can I just see, is there anyone in the room that really took hold of that prayer this morning? Just put your hands up nice and high. Hold it high. Hold it high. Come on. Father, we thank you for our response this morning. We thank you for the response of faith and our response to your presence. And I ask God that you seal this response this morning in every person's heart. That faith becomes a new reality and a new nature and we thank you for that in jesus name can we give god a massive hand for his presence for his glory for his honor in this house come on i just see god is changing lives i see god is doing a new thing in every person i just want to declare that over you receive the new season that you're walking into and too many people have said we're in a new season as a cliche but I can feel it in my spirit. We are moving forward in a new way that we have never, ever moved in before. Amen. Amen. 
All right, you are free to go or join the party. <laughs> We're going to just praise him and just have a good time together.